Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you for all of those who are online. Uh, we see slowly, it, it usually takes five, ten minutes for people to stream in. Uh, but we will always start on time for those who are here on time. Uh, thank you for making time. Today we have a very interesting topic, uh, money and morals, which typically in, in a lot of people's minds does not come together. Uh, but before I give a little bit of, you know, some ideas and uh, some opinions and some perspectives, um, we have with us Mr. Blake Goat, who is uh, currently in the UK, right Blake? No, in the US. Oh, you're currently in the US, okay. Yeah, Blake flies a lot, a lot. it gets con confusing at times. <laughs> uh, Blake is the CEO of RFI Foundation, uh, the Responsible Finance Institute. Uh, he will be sharing a little bit more about the institute and the foundation and what they do. Uh, immediately after I give, you know, some, uh, my part of, of this session. So as usual, I'm the moderator. Uh, I'll be here to ask questions and to help you seek answers and to ask questions which you submit to us. So please make sure you submit all your questions. It will be at the end of this one hour session where we will uh, select as many questions as we can coming from you uh, for Blake and, and maybe myself uh, to explain or to answer. Yeah. Now, just, just, let's just get some ideas out there, some uh, brain juices flowing. Money and morals, these are two words that in many people's minds do not come together. Right? We know the, the infamous maxim of uh, money is the root of all evil. <laughs> so is that, is that necessarily true? Is that the way it should be? Is money a tool of evil? Does money create evil? You know? So uh, we are, that, that's a bit philosophical, right? And we all know money is just a medium. It's a medium of exchange. It's a medium of purchase. It's a medium of investment. Uh, today, money itself has, has started to evolve in terms of its form, right? So how does that change morality when it comes to money? Yeah, but let's backtrack a little bit, uh, a little bit of my own uh, opinions and perspectives. Now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, money is a medium. And it is a medium that you can choose to use for good or for bad. Right, just like platforms, let's say I have a table, I can use it uh, to do good things, or I can use it to as a criminal mastermind, right? Planning bad things. So money in the same way, it's up to the user. And a little bit from the Islamic perspective, I'm not a Sharia scholar, but from my understanding uh, based on what other Sharia scholars or Sharia scholars tell me when I ask them about money, uh, they say something very interesting, which is that money in itself does not have the intrinsic good or bad. Uh, for example, let me give you context. Uh, we, have, we have Global Sedekah, a charity platform. So somebody has dirty money, right? Let's say that money is tainted by interest or riba, or he obtained that money from a business that is not moral or, or not halal from the Islamic perspective. Can he then donate to something good? Now, what the scholars tell me is that he can, because his intention when he gives that money to the charity is, or to the social um, initiative, it's a good intention. The fact that the money was derived in the past from a bad uh, or less moral um, beginning or outcome or activities does not uh, affect the nature of the money itself. Yeah? So that's a very interesting thing that struck me early on when I started uh, studying about Islamic finance. It is the usage of the money uh, that makes that activity haram or halal. It is not the, the money in itself in that way. Yeah? So um, with that as a starting point, we are going to go into this presentation on money and morals. And this will focus uh, more on the responsible investment, social investment, impact investment angle, right? All of you are here and online because you want to know what, whether and if you can do good with your money and still make profit from it and still have a good investment. So the discussion today will revolve around that and also some statistics that Blake has to share uh, from a recent report that they published. So inshallah, it'll be very interesting. And uh, without further ado, I'll pass on uh, this session to Blake. Blake, please. Yeah, thank you, Umar. Uh, thanks for organizing uh, the webinar and inviting me to speak. Uh, I'm the CEO of the RFI Foundation, the Responsible Finance and Investment Foundation. Uh, we were set up three years ago in uh, the UK, we have a global footprint. Uh, I'm based in the US. We have trustees from the UK, Middle East, Southeast Asia, Africa, 
Uh, so we have a, a really global representation. Uh, and our mission is to build awareness about responsible finance, uh, which we define as socially responsible investment, environmental, social, and governance, uh, impact investment in Islamic finance, uh, and I'll go into some of those definitions a little bit later. Uh, so we're working to build awareness, uh, promote research, and I'll bring some, some of the insights that we've uh, gained through our research, uh, and ultimately uh, promote convergence. Uh, the objectives of responsible finance have many overlaps. Uh, the values that, that are driving people to link their money and the, their morals uh, have many common grounds between Islamic finance and other uh, other parts of the responsible finance market, uh, and so there's no need to reinvent uh, reinvent the same thing over again in each in each area. Uh, there can be collaboration uh, to to move to move the outcomes uh, further, and so I think the the real change recently uh, in terms of thinking about money and morals is that it it's it's not separated anymore. Before, uh, a lot of people in previous generations, people thought about, you know, you go to work, you earn your money, and then you use the money uh, to uh, participate in moral activities, whether that's charitable giving um, or support for uh, small businesses. Uh, and, and they were separate. You, you either are making money or you're using it to fulfill a moral obligation. Uh, and in, in recent years, that that has come together uh, into the idea that not only should you be using your money for moral purposes, you should be earning it in moral ways as well. Um, and that's where uh, responsible investment uh, has come from. Uh, ethical investment, Islamic finance, they're, they're all built around this idea that, that money and morals uh, need to be combined uh, together. And so when you start looking at the responsible finance market, and I defined a couple areas of what we define as responsible finance at the RFI Foundation. There's a lot of terms uh, that get thrown around, responsible, sustainable, impact, uh, and it's not always clear what these terms mean. So I, I just went through and uh, put down as many of the different, uh, different terms I could think of. Uh, and really what it comes down to, you can think about it as a sequencing of why are people uh, doing what they're doing uh, and managing their, their money in a particular way. Um, and whether and are they doing it primarily for an ethical reason or for a financial reason? So socially responsible investment, which has been around, I think, the longest, uh, usually takes the, the ethical perspective. We're going to avoid investment in particular sectors because we believe that it's uh, unethical or it's creating social harm. Um, and so that that's overlaps a lot with uh, many of the Sharia screens used in Islamic investment, so avoiding weapons, avoiding alcohol, tobacco, uh, gambling. And it, it doesn't necessarily factor in whether the, the ethical restrictions are having a financial cost. In more recent years, environmental, social, and governance and responsible investment have come around that try to approach from a different angle of looking at what can we do from a financial perspective? We see that environmental issues are causing financial implications. Uh, social issues are causing financial implications for investments. How do we build these in where we are achieving a similar ethical objective, but, but coming from uh, the perspective of analyzing it through financial means so that we're trying to achieve a market rate or better returns um, and also have a, a positive impact on society? And beyond there, there's, there's a mix that starts to happen uh, when you look at other parts of the responsible finance market. Um, social finance aims towards uh, social objectives, positive social benefit. Uh, green finance aims at environmental benefit. Sustainable finance brings social and environmental benefit uh, into the equation uh, together. And then impact investment is, I think, the most flexible in terms of having a wide range of trade-offs between economic, social, and environmental benefit. Uh, all of them are, are viewed as, as important, and depending on the impact investor, they may prioritize one over the other and aim for either market rate returns, below market rate returns, or just the, the idea of trying to preserve capital so that it can be re reinvested and not, not seeking a, a positive uh, 
total return. And so ESG is the, the one that has picked up the most, uh, the most breadth in financial markets recently. Uh, there was a study just out, I think, today from the from Eurosif, the Sustainable Investment Forum in Europe, uh, that showed a 60% growth uh, in the last two years of the assets being managed with uh, a focus on ESG. Um, and so it's the it's impact investment is growing faster, but from a much smaller uh, base. ESG is seeming to become the biggest contributor for responsible investment. Uh, in terms of combining a focus on environmental, social, and governance issues with uh, with investment decisions, and it comes with a benefit uh, in terms of uh, studies have found better ESG lowers cost of capital for companies, uh, which means that they can invest in more projects. They can um, uh, because more projects that they have on the on their plate um, will exceed the cost of the capital needed to invest. Uh, the companies tend to perform better when they have better management of their environmental and social and governance risks. Uh, so their operational performance, they do better in terms of turning their, turning their revenue into profits. Uh, they're more efficient. Uh, and then as a result, the investment performance tends to be better. Uh, different studies have found different levels of how much better or but the vast majority say that they deliver equal or better returns. So there's the, so this is an idea that you don't necessarily have to have a financial cost from incorporating morals into financial decision making, which I think is, is something new uh, that's, that's really only been uh, accepted now in the last uh, 10 or 12 years. So Islamic finance fits within this, uh, like I mentioned, um, with many of the socially responsible investment screens of using ethical screens to, to avoid investments that, that are contradictory to, to Islamic uh, morals. And, and that's been primarily the uh, main instrument for uh, doing investment from an Islamic finance perspective. But there's a wider conception um, that's out there uh, and is becoming more commonplace that Islamic financial institutions have a social, social responsibility to effectively and efficiently mobilize resources for the benefit of the community. And Islam itself extensively emphasizes uh, ethical, environmental, and social impact on stakeholders. So it's not only a profit at all costs, There's, there is a consideration of how those profits are being generated. Um, in terms of Islamic finance today, not all of these environmental and social impacts are getting factored into the, the process of, of financing or investment in a systematic way. Uh, and the outputs are not very well documented. So it's really difficult to see a full picture of what's being done across the Islamic financial in, uh, industry. A few examples uh, that we've that we put in our uh, report um, of different responsible investment projects that have been financed with Islamic finance. Uh, mass transit in Malaysia, renewable energy in Jordan. Uh, Athens Crowd, of course, has uh, done a lot of crowdfunding-based uh, projects for affordable housing in Indonesia. Um, and then the World Bank has uh, acted as treasury manager for the International Finance Facility for Immunization, the vaccine for coup, which funded about half of the, the total project to take donor grants that are coming in over a long period of time and bring forward those the the funds so that they can be used immediately to uh, to purchase and, and distribute vaccines uh, for children in developing countries. So there there are activities in the Islamic financial in, in, industry that that go beyond uh, the sort of ethically driven um, exclusions driven approach to, to investment and finance. And so we asked uh, in our survey that we released at our summit in April, we asked uh, about 35 Islamic financial institutions, do you think that sustainable finance practices inherently have a link to Islamic finance principles? And we found that almost all of them do. All, almost all of them see that these, that these ideas are, are linked, that there's the Islamic uh, financial practices uh, that are in place today of avoiding uh, Libra, uh, and the unethical 
uh, business activities, harm business activities, uh, as well as environmental and social factors, that there's, that there's a link between the two. Uh, and then we asked, sort of looking forward, what are the types of issues that are most relevant within the Islamic financial institutions perspective for the next uh, three years? And the, the top three were education, uh, so supporting education uh, and research around uh, sustainable finance, uh, investing in environmentally friendly industries and uh, small, medium-sized businesses, uh, expanding financial inclusion. Uh, some of the other issues that didn't didn't get as uh, weren't as widely cited, but were still uh, mentioned, were sustainable urban development, like the mass transit that we just that I mentioned earlier, uh, healthcare, like the vaccines or cook would be an example of that, environmental management and food security, uh, which are longer term issues that um, that will require probably more of a systematic uh, effort within Islamic finance uh, to to really see the. the be taken into account across the industry. And then that, the, the question is, with, because there's uh, the, the narrow area of where a lot of Islamic finance focuses now and these environmental and social uh, impacts that mm -hmm. are seen as linked to Islamic uh, values, uh, but where does Islamic finance add value compared to the responsible finance practices being done across the world today? around environmental and social issues. Um, and so there was a research paper last year um, uh, released by Setco Capital uh, that, that did a, a detailed uh, study of do Islamic investments perform differently than socially responsible investments? Because that's the, the, the closest analogy. And they found that the, uh, particularly the financial ratio screen really created different, uh, different risk return uh, outcomes that, that that they found was favorable for Islamic investment um, versus either socially responsible investment or unscreened uh, portfolios. And they found, they looked at some of the reasons why and uh, without getting into too much of the detail, they found that the companies uh, that were included in the portfolios with Islamic screening tended to have uh, stronger growth, tended to have higher quality balance sheets and have lower leverage. And so you can see that that directly flows from some of the uh, some of the Sharia restrictions that are that are put in place in a screening, in Islamic screening exercise uh, that are driving uh, better performance. So it really, I think, opens up uh, some opportunities for Islamic finance to be able to address not only environmental and social issues, but also some of the, the uh, systemic and risk um, issues that we've seen have a big impact in the financial sector. Uh, the financial crisis 10 years ago is a really good example because it was really uh, primarily fueled by uh, excessive debt. Uh, and so the, those are the types of things that get uh, constrained uh, using a Sharia screening process, uh, which may not deliver the best returns at every time in the cycle because when people are very excited and you know, everything seems like a good idea, then, then borrowing money makes them seem like even a better idea. But when the, when the cycle turns, uh, the downside tends to be worse than the upside was. And so by constraining some of the, the speculative activity, uh, like the Sharia screens do, uh, can, can create a better overall return. And it's not something that's, that's typically found in uh, other responsible finance uh, practices. So looking forward and, and what does responsible finance accomplish and does it truly do good? Uh, the answer is, is pretty un unsatisfying at this point of it depends. Uh, there's an inherent inability to understand how responsible finance practices translate an impact on a wide scale because there's so many different ideas about what is, uh, what is responsible, what does responsible finance mean? There's been some progress recently to try to create frameworks that, uh, that narrow or group together some of the, the common practices and better define how financial institutions approach responsible finance of what are they trying, what impact are they trying to create and how, how can they measure, uh, measure on the, out, uh, the outcomes. Uh, 
Um, and so the impact measurement product management project is doing that in the impact investment area. Uh, the task force for climate related financial disclosures is uh, putting in place some standardization about how to report uh, carbon dioxide emissions uh, and climate change uh, risks. And so it, it's coming along. There, there's still lacking a centralized source of information about what responsible finance means in practice. Uh, right now, the data that, like the Eurosif data that I cited before, breaks it down into very broad categories of negative screening, positive screening, ESG integration, and impact uh, focus. Um, and so to create a better idea of what responsible finance is, to answer the question, does it truly do good, uh, there needs to be more detailed uh, data collected, and that's something that the RFI Foundation has been been working on with a, an initiative that we announced at the G20 in September called the Seeded Initiative that is effectively a database of commitments and actions to show progression uh, across all of responsible finance, not just Islamic finance, um, and try to give a better idea of what are the outcomes, uh, does responsible finance do good, and how much, how much of what we're seeing in responsible finance is, is talk, and how much of it is actually translating into action. And so I think that's that's where I'll leave it for the uh, for the presentation. Right, thank you very much, Blake, for for sharing. Uh, I think I, be, I believe that for those who are online, uh, it's been it was quite clear for me. It's very clear. Uh, but if you do have any questions specifically about the content, uh, the slides that were shared, uh, that was just shared, uh, please send in your questions. We can get it. We will get those questions immediately. Uh, if you have questions outside of the scope of this presentation, that's of course also welcome. Uh, I have a few questions on my, of my own, which I will ask to, to kickstart uh, the conversation. Now, um, you did focus quite a lot on uh, how Islamic finance and uh, ethical, let's just call it ethical finance or morals in finance converge. Uh, not only converge, uh, I mean, they can be seen as converging, they can be seen as overlapping, they can be seen as mutually reinforcing also, right? Mm -hmm. Those are three sort of three areas that you touched on. Is that accurate? Yeah. 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 Now, um, maybe this is a bit uh, more, more philosophical, more, a bit deeper. Um, for for those who understand Islamic finance, and of course for, for Muslims also, uh, when we talk about religion or our religion, uh, there's supposed to be an inherent uh, automatic morality uh, present, right? In fact, it's supposed to be based on morals and then we layer on the economic activities and so on above that. Uh, in your interactions as, uh, in the industry, as well as in the finance, in the responsible finance uh, industry outside of, or the world outside of, Islamic uh, finance and banking. Do you see that there is a, a difference in terms of recognizing this? Uh, when we're in the normal, in the conventional so-called finance industry, is it uh, only when they, uh, when they adopt or when they engage in doing ethical activities that they are aware? And when they are not, they, are, they don't care about it because it's purely capitalist? And is it different in the Islamic finance world where Automatically, everybody sees some ethical uh, element to it. Just, just your your experience when you deal with the, the two worlds. Well, I think it really depends on uh, where the decisions are coming from and it, what are motivating the decisions. And this applies both within Islamic finance and within uh, other parts of the financial world. Uh, most of the, uh, a lot of the Islamic financial industry's development has been fueled by the idea that, that we want to have a, a Sharia compliant option um, and how does that fit into to the general financial system that exists today. And it's a similar question that, that's faced uh, other parts of responsible finance. Uh, how uh, there's always the difference between the ideals and the practical, uh, the practical realities. Uh, so you can look at, you know, it, uh, there's a, a narrow, a narrow approach of you know this, this is what we have to do, and this is what we want to do, or this is what we aspire to do. So I think um, there, you know, many of the people who work in the field feel uh, are, feel real drawn, really drawn to it by the 
the aspirational side uh, and you know maybe disappointed on the on the way that it translates into practice and I think that that's something that's been common I've seen across responsible investment across ESG across uh, economic finance as well uh, is that it's always there's always a tension between uh, doing it you know doing it as much uh, to the to the degree that we would like to see uh, and how much uh, the, the current day realities uh, constrain that, whether that's regulatory, whether that's competitive. Um, so I think it's 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 always a, it's always a tension, and it's the the more that the more that people strive to to do good and increase the amount of uh, aspirational activity that, that's actually translating into practice, uh, the more we see it uh, the industry. Uh, be able to achieve. All right. Okay. Thank you for that. Sir. Um, just touching on your earlier point, you said a lot depends. On, uh, a lot depends on who uh, who's influencing the decisions and the direction of the financial institutes. Um, I, today, there's. I mean, increasingly, I, I wouldn't say it has become mainstream yet, but increasingly, um, there's a lot more opportunity and a lot more role for users and consumers and customers. Uh, to guide and eventually maybe even dictate uh, what the service providers do uh, because increasingly service providers are more in tune or more aligned towards their con what consumers want instead of what they want or internally what their shareholders and stakeholders want. Uh, is, has there been an impact on this, uh, let's say through fintech uh, and other forms, that do banks feel the heat from the people uh, and is there that heat in the first place of people wanting to see more ethical uh, approaches to finance and more moral uh, investments. Yeah, I think that there really has been a, a big change, and in part, of it, it's come from a generational shift with the you know, younger people being more interested in, in environmental and social issues in their uh, in their financial decisions. Uh, and fintech, I think, has really helped because it, it pushes the envelope on what's possible. And when it's just uh, you know banks or just large investment companies that are uh, developing products, they can they they, they have a natural conservatism because uh, they, they tend to be established and have established business models, uh, and innovation is hard in those contexts. And so what what fintech companies are able to show is that no, there's there's, there's a different way that's possible, and it really I think forces forces more uh, more dramatic change within the within the financial sector uh, outside of fintech than would, would take place otherwise. All right, thanks for that. Uh, just, just being a little bit of a devil's advocate for this point, um, I, I do study uh, how fintech impacts people, impacts communities in different countries. Uh, and there are countries where it's really growing very rapidly, but in many cases, I do also observe very predatory lending practices by fintech companies purely because there is a gap and people are desperate and they need money. So this, and because um, non-fintechs are heavily regulated, so there is that level, that, that minimum uh, level of, um, you know, being in line with what regulators feel is not predatory. Uh, but when it comes to fintech, sometimes it's the world, you know, the, the wild west, you can do whatever you want in some countries because it's not yet regulated. And I have uh, observed on a number of occasions, uh, fintechs charging crazy interest rates you know, there's even a fintech company that charged two percent a day on uh, consumer loans, right? So uh, that was quite crazy. Uh, over time, it went down because they said their data is better now; the risk is lower now. <laughs> but uh, my point is, uh, do you think this is just something that's sort of a transitionary maturity period, or have we opened up another, uh, uh, or has fintech opened up an avenue for exploitation through finance? There's definitely uh, uh, an avenue for exploitation, and I think you know technology can be neutral in many contexts, uh, and there can also be ways in which can be uh, it can enable more uh, exploitation. So, like the idea, like the consumer lending uh, type applications that you're talking about, uh, because it's available, you know, at a click of a button on your on your phone, there. It may be more susceptible to to companies that you know want to use 
people's uh, impatience, I guess, uh, as a way to, to sort of entrap them in a, in a death cycle. And that's not an inherent quality of the technology, but it's something that the technology enables. And it's really important for uh, to balance uh, how the, the regulators are looking at fintech. And I think that's, you know, the, the biggest challenge for regulators of how to deal with fintech is how to balance uh, that consumer protection angle uh, and keeping out the, the bad bad actors, basically, uh, or the exploitative companies, but without clamping off uh, the opportunity for the innovation that, that's really allowed uh, companies that are trying to do uh, to do new new business models that, that have positive social and environmental impact uh, built in that are not possible within the, the context of you know, larger banks, larger investment companies. All right. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, definitely it's true. It's about how uh, this, this actually links a, a question that's asked by one of the participants. Um, and uh, I guess his question is a bit more generic. The question is, is there any mechanism uh, in place or any standards for companies to follow to make ethical financial decisions? Uh, so I guess the question, the way it's traced, focuses also, uh, more on companies, uh, not specifically finance companies. Uh, how do they know or how do they follow or what can they, where can they go to, to refer uh, to what's ethical finance? There's, that's been one of the challenges uh, with defining what ethical finance or responsible finance is, is that because each person has a different, um, different de definition of what they believe is ethical, uh, financial, uh, financial institutions have, uh, adapted uh, a more flexible approach of you know they can they can deliver whatever is demanded by the by the customers and that that leads to a lot of uh, questions about you know how how do you compare one ethical option with another uh, because there's there's not necessarily uh, going to be consistency guaranteed between the two uh, and that's one of the one of the issues that we found uh, that we're addressing with the CETA initiative is that for institutions that are new to new to the issues around ethical finance, it's it's fairly daunting and not very transparent about what are the most common practices, uh, what are the what are the things that that create the the biggest impact and are the ones that are not just being talked about but are actually translating into practice. So it's it's definitely uh, an issue, and there's efforts within different subsets. To, to create some standardization, but it's very, uh, very early stage right now. All right. Well, so, so back to the alignment uh, of or the synchronization of what's ethical and, and what's not. Uh, where do you see the greatest progress uh, happening in this space to try to align all the different standards or at least to come up with a general framework uh, that encompasses, uh, you know, the basics of all the different standards is there any particular initiative, organization, or movement that you feel is getting good traction? You can see I RFI. Think the, what? You can see RFI, RFI itself. <laughs> well, what the approach we're taking is not to try to standardize, but uh, to try to uh, help financial institutions navigate uh, the very different areas. The most, the most developed uh, has been around specific. Uh, measurement issues and tracking issues around uh, things that are very quantifiable. So carbon dioxide emissions is, is one example. Um, and the green finance area has been much further ahead uh, than compared to social social impact at defining what it means. And the um, I think the leading effort, the one that's going to become the standard going forward, most likely is uh, the efforts uh, by the European Commission uh, there's an expert, technical expert group um, on sustainable finance that's working on a green taxonomy. So defining every, uh, defining with as much detail as, as possible what is green and what is not. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see whether we have any questions. Uh, all the questions have been asked and answered. If there are any more questions, please uh, keep it flowing. We will answer them as soon as we can. Uh, I have another question. I have a lot of questions here. 
Let's see which questions are not answered yet. Yeah. Now, uh, we've been talking about how to be more ethical, more responsible, or more moral, uh, meaning what are all the plus, plus points that can be added on, right? Um, there's also the approach of neg negative screening uh, kind of approach where you are not allowed, you're not supposed to do A, B, C, D, and E, right? So it's like carrot uh, compared to a stick approach. Uh, right now, the way the industry is regulated, or not regulated, sorry, the way the industry is set up and the way it is actually functioning, um, is, is do you think there needs to be more emphasis on the minimum level, meaning these are the things that should not or cannot be done, uh, instead of you know uh, having more plus, pluses by then, there's only, the way I see it, there's only a limited group of, of companies and institutions interested to, to do more and more. And, and inshallah, they will continue doing more and more good. But there's still that huge base of companies that continue to do bad stuff, right? So should there be more emphasis in preventing that and stopping that maybe at a more uh, uh, authoritarian level uh, with governments getting on board or, or different groups of, of countries coming on board to prevent all these things? Well, I think the, there's a, a real big difference between what, what negative activity is being uh, done and being financed uh, that can be mitigated, the, the negative impacts can be mitigated, and that's that's where the the uh, sort of blunt approach of you know either we invest or we uh, completely exclude has uh, become less less uh, relevant. Is that those companies, if you cease to invest in them, that there will be plenty of other people who will still invest in them, and you'll lose the opportunity to uh, change their behavior. Um, so there's there's been uh, an increased uh, attention paid to how how do institutions and, and investors uh, stay invested to some degree with companies uh, to to push them to improve their behavior, whether that's re reducing their amount of uh, leverage or reducing their environmental footprint. Um, but it the the tough part with that comes with you know where do you draw the line of what cannot be mitigated uh, effectively or what companies have you engaged with to the point where they've refused uh, to to try to um, improve their performance um, so I think that's that's an area that hasn't been uh, that there's a lot of diverse opinions about um, but uh, the report from Eurosif that I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the things that I thought was particularly interesting was that overall, even though ex the, the exclusions-based screening, so they, like, uh, avoiding certain investments, is the largest component of responsible investment around the world, uh, it's shrinking um, as, a, as a share of the total. And it's being replaced by uh, ESG and uh, engagement strategies. So finding companies that you're invested in and if they're not doing uh, things that are that are right for society that you first work to, to engage with them to try to get them to change their behavior before uh, before deciding whether it's you know either can't be can't be mitigated uh, it's just you know, inherently uh, something that's negative for the for society for the environment uh, or that the company refuses to, to change their behavior. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, there's another question here. Can pos I'll just read it out. Uh, can positive screens be used to increase um, the Islamic investable universe? Or could there be new screens considering net positive impact? Do you get that? Uh, I, I didn't hear the last bit. So can positive screens be used to increase the Islamic investment universe? I think increase the size of, of what's Islamic. I'm not too sure about the first question. Uh, then there's a continuation. Or could there be new screens that consider net positive impact? That's, I think, an area that is going to um, uh, need to be addressed, not just to uh, expand the universe. I think that with Islamic investment, um, the exclusions tend to be fairly black and white, uh, particularly around the sector screens. Uh, and so unless there's, unless there's a concerted effort uh, within the Islamic investment community to, to undertake uh, 
positive engagement, and, and there has been uh, through uh, organizations like the Interfaith Center for Corporate Responsibility. Um, that then it's it's going to be difficult to expand the universe that way. Um, however, um, there's always a question once you have the list of what's permissible to invest in, how much do you want to invest in different com uh, different companies? And I think that's where you can start seeing um, net positive impact be be used as a measurement tool to to affect how how much you invest in different companies or how you balance. Uh, investments between different uh, different companies. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, there is this concept of carbon credits, right? I think just just for for those who are not so familiar, uh, there's the concept of carbon credits where companies are allowed to have a certain amount of uh, carbon emissions or carbon footprint, and uh, the only way they can go beyond that is to purchase uh, carbon credits from others who are not using their carbon credits. So this creates like a, some sort of uh, market pressure for those who can and are and want to, to cut down on their carbon emissions to be able to earn a, some form of uh, income uh, from trading their credits. So this encourages innovation on one side and encourage, encourages those who want to become greener uh, uh, and at the same time makes it more expensive for those who want to pollute more. Now, is there some form of mechanism, uh, similar mechanism that I, I feel this is a good approach uh, because you let the market, you know, create solutions and incentivize them that way or disincentivize them that way. Uh, can we, is there a way to, do you see a way to expand this beyond uh, carbon credits to a wider uh, scope of, of ethical finance? I think that uh, this may be my economist background uh, coming through, but uh, the way that carbon credits have worked has been slightly less a fit or less worth. The second best option, uh, this sort of carbon tax uh, is what economists favor because it requires less intervention. Uh, the carbon credits scheme, you have to figure out what, what uh, level of emissions are okay. Uh, uh, and then you issue and you try to match that, match supply and demand. And so it's, it's not entirely a pure market mechanism and has created some volatility uh, where it's been applied. The European carbon credit market uh, uh, went through a big uh, big period of, of having to somewhat be restructured. Uh, but I think the general idea of uh, factoring in the true social cost of the negative social and environmental impact is important and should be included more into uh, into the into finance in particular, because finance uh, is the most sensitive, I think, to, to ch small changes in, in relative prices. All right. Okay. Uh, but how, how how does the how does the tax encourage uh, progress in in the correct direction? It, it disincentivizes, but I don't really see the incentivizing angle there. Well, it comes with. Uh, the, the incentive is really through that, uh, and, and it's not only just a disincentive. Uh, the the costs associated with carbon dioxide emissions are greater than zero, and right now they're being priced at zero uh, implicitly by the the way that we're not putting a price on them. Uh, and the same same goes with other environmental and social impacts. And so it's really just uh, it's not necessarily uh, changing the market, but uh, correcting uh, a, an oversight in how we, uh, in how markets function. Uh, and so that, and the, the most pure, sort of the most pure basic way for the, for the, like a carbon tax to be implemented isn't, isn't used as a, as a net revenue generator, but it's something that, you know, collects uh, the revenue from t carbon taxes to reduce the uh, level of emissions. Uh, and then just uh, returns the money in a way that doesn't doesn't favor carbon uh, carbon uh, emission uh, intensive uh, businesses. So it would you know every every person gets a equal share of the the revenue if you want one way. Uh, yeah, I understand. So it's both a disincentive as well as uh, an incentive itself, <clears throat> right? Now. Um, so it's, um, 
I have another question for you uh, related more to the investor side. Uh, so far, we've been speaking quite a bit about the industry and the financial institutes and companies. Uh, for investors, um, the way I see things is investors should naturally, logically gravitate towards social impact investments or impact investments in general. Um, because I feel that's the nature of human beings, so we want to do good. Uh, however, some, and, and in our experience, we do see a lot of people coming on board and they are attracted to us sometimes mainly because of the social impact outside of the commercial uh, returns. Now, um, how do we increase this exponentially? How do we dramatically increase the buy-in interest and keenness of the masses to engage in, in uh, ethical investment? Well, I think that's been one of the challenges that's, that, that's been facing responsible investment um, on, a, on a widespread level of, of reaching uh, particularly retail markets, uh, is that it's very difficult for uh, people who are not exposed to the financial industry every day to, to differentiate between what is something that, that demonstrates positive, true social impact and what is uh, a marketing message that, that appears to, to be demonstrating positive social impact but may not have be as effective. And so it's always about how does the impact get categorized and, and how does it uh, show up as visible to uh, to the investors and so part of that comes from uh, better transparency of reporting and so the impact measurement project is is one way that impact investment has has been standardizing at least some of the, the framework of what type of information is being reported um, another way is educating people who investors trust and rely on to be more educated about uh, differentiating between uh, between effective and not and less effective uh, social and environmental impact uh, financial institutions or uh, financial instruments, uh, and it takes it's taken a lot longer than people uh, had expected. I think for the you know for for years and years uh, there's been a constant theme uh, in more developed responsible investment markets like Europe, uh, that you know, this is going to be the year when a retail market really grows. And it, it has been sort of a disappointment, it seems, uh, for, many, for a couple of years, uh, year after year. So I, but that suddenly seems to be changing. Um, the uh, that Eurostep report, uh, one of the interesting findings from that was that in 2014, the share of responsible investment assets in Europe that were retail-focused, um, the was uh, around three uh, percent, and it didn't seem to be increasing very quickly. But then now you, the latest numbers that were out, that share has increased to thirty percent. So it it gets to a tipping point. It's, people get comfortable enough that, uh, that with what's happening, uh, that they that they gain confidence, and it's it's really all about uh, educating. Uh, educating investors, educating people that investors uh, talk to and rely upon. All right. Okay. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing. Okay. So thank you so much, uh, Blake. I think uh, we do not have any other questions from the crowd. Uh, this will be shown. Uh, this will be hosted on our website. Uh, those who signed up but were not able to. To join this, we'll send them an email, right? We'll send them an email with this video recording. But the video will live on in the website for everybody to watch uh, moving forward. Uh, inshallah, but, you know, uh, indefinitely it'll be there. Uh, it's recorded. Uh, so you can revisit this at any time. Uh, for all those watching, thank you for your time. Um, again, it was, please feel free to share this uh, with all your different, with your friends and uh, your network. Um, before we end, I just want to share a little bit more on said some uh, things that we are working on and then maybe I'll give, I'll give Blake uh, a few moments to just share a little bit more about RFI uh, so that the, the crowd can understand better what are the objectives of the RFI and what are some of the activities that we have. Um, there, there is a request for your slides. I think it shouldn't be a problem to share that. Blake, yeah? yeah? Please do. Okay. No problem. Yeah. No. All right. Thank you so much. So for, um, for us right now in Ethis, we have been focused on social housing for the past few years, specifically for in Indonesia. 
And right now, um, what we are working on uh, uh, right now today, uh, and uh, inshallah launching very soon, is the same concept of Islamic investment, ethical investment into social housing development projects with uh, good sustainable profit. Um, what we are working on is actually to do the same thing, the same kind of approach, but for disaster regions, disaster uh, hit regions, uh, starting with Lombok, which encountered uh, a terrible earthquake about uh, two months ago, and um, a series of aftershocks, about 100 aftershocks after that. So the people there are in great need. The, the government estimates they need more than 100,000 houses. So what we're doing is we're channeling impact investment uh, to developing more houses. At the same time, also, we're working with a few charities who are uh, contributing to a revolving fund. Uh, and this fund will be similar to the Wakaf Cash Wakaf concept, where the fund will be utilized to develop houses. And then the fund, uh, at the point of exit or completion of the project, the fund will be replenished and go back out to build more houses uh, for, for the low income. Uh, in this case, not only the low income, but those who are also affected by the disaster uh, with their houses destroyed. Uh, so, inshallah, we hope that this is something that will pick up a lot of momentum and a lot of interest so that we can help more people uh, in Lombok to rebuild their lives uh, through building them houses, inshallah. Yep, so, that's the main thing that I wanted to share in terms of our current focus for ethical investment. And Blink, I'll, I'll leave it to you to take the last few minutes to share whatever you'd like. Okay. Well, I really uh, appreciate the update that you give uh, and the, the work that you've been doing. And uh, the area of Islamic social finance is really, uh, really exciting and really important. Um, and I, I, I just hope that, you know, every, every new example uh, that, you know, from Ethis and from other, uh, others encourages more conscious activity of how can we increase social impact. Uh, with, and with RFI, uh, where we're focused is uh, twofold on the financial industry side of helping financial institutions better uh, address their, their responsible finance practices uh, on the one hand, and then building a network uh, of people who are uh, keen to be uh, involved or support it. Uh, and who want to be tapped into uh, to what's happening. So we have, uh, we work with our financial institution members, and then we also have a network of uh, individual members uh, who are interested and engaged in Islamic and responsible finance. Uh, and be happy to share more information about that with anyone who's interested. You can uh, find us on Twitter at RFI Foundation, and you can uh, tweet to me at, uh, at sharing risk. Thank you, Omar, uh, again for, for the invitation. Thank you, Blake, for your time. Much appreciated. Uh, have a good night. <laughs> it's really quite late over there. Uh, just one last point for everyone. Uh, we, there's, a, there's a forum. Uh, there's a website, forum.islamicfintech.org.org. It's a very simple forum. It's a beta forum where you can upload any questions you may have on today's session or any other questions in general about fintech, Islamic fintech. It's an open forum. You can ask questions. You can answer questions. Uh, so I'll just repeat it. Forum.islamifintech.org. All right. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Uh, appreciate your, your participation. And uh, next month, every month, we have a webinar on different, different topics. And uh, we hope to reach out to as many people as possible. So do support the future webinars. Participate in the future webinars. And let us know if you have any uh, topics or any, any issues uh, that you want us to focus on over these webinars. Right, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Blake. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you.